All right, guys, good afternoon. We're ready for our next presentation. Uh, with us here, we have Jamie Schmidt. Uh, she specializes in content strategy and information architecture. She's the community evangelist at Sidewalk, and she's here to talk to you about making security make sense. Jamie Schmidt. I'm the community evangelist at SiteLock. I'm also a freelancer and I've been doing freelance for um, almost 10 years now um, with agencies, doing contract work at enterprise level, all the way down to building pro bono websites for um, nonprofits. So I've kind of worked at in websites on every scale and um, I've, I've seen the pain points at all of them and every single one has pain points. Um, and I'm passionate about WordPress and Drupal and content enthusiasts. I love to do content strategy. I'm very big about planning things out before um, before uh, I implement them. And uh, security is one thing that I like to plan out before uh, hacks websites get implemented under my care. So this fits in totally with everything that that I believe in here. And I'm also a proud cat mom in Portland, Oregon. Um, so we're going to cover kind of a bunch of stuff today, um, but it's it's not going to be so like info heavy that you're going to feel overwhelmed. Um, I'm trying to do the talk in a sort of way where you're going to come you're going to come out with more of a holistic understanding and view, and hopefully um, inspiration on putting some sort of a kind of era, uh, security strategy in place on your sites. Um, so we're going to talk about securing your own site your uh, client sites, um, the benefits of all of those things, and then some security best practices, just very sort of like baseline best practices, and then some strategies for actually integrating that the security part into your overall um, web development phase. Um, so just really quickly, who in here um, builds websites for people? <laughs> okay. That's what I figured. Um, okay, also, who has ever either had their own site hacked or had to fix a hacked site? Yeah, it sucks. Um, <laughs> it sucks to have to happen to you and have to hire someone to fix it, and it also sucks to be the person that has to fix it, because hacked sites are um, almost never predictable. It's a lot of times is um, never the same thing twice with, with new clients. Sometimes it is the same thing twice with existing clients if your only um, steps to fixing a hacked site are to restore backup because that doesn't actually fix the vulnerability. Um, so we're going to move on to the benefits of securing your site. It seems like these are kind of um, obvious that um, there are benefits of securing the site. Um, but the first one is pretty much own your reputation. Um, website hacks. I happen all day, every day. Um, I think it's like 44 attacks um, are attempted on your website, any website, every day. Whether or not they get in um, really has to do with how locked down and how secure the site is. Um, but it's especially important when you are the person that is providing the website services. A lot of times clients have an idea that since you're the one that built their site, um, that it's completely secure, it's, it's just sort of assumed that it's not going to get hacked. Um, and it's assumed, usually by the client, that you're the person that is in charge of making sure it doesn't get hacked. Um, that's not necessarily the, um, the way that it goes. Um, but So a successful attack on the site um, can make you look bad to your client. Um, if your own site is hacked as developers and someone tries to go to it and Google pops up the notification that it's not a trusted site, that doesn't look good for you. Um, and people aren't going to like call you for that. They're going to be like, wow, this person's site is hacked. Um, I'm going to go look for someone else. So obviously you don't want your site, your own personal site to be hacked. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so having your own site hacked is, looks bad. So owning your reputation, being the first point of a successfully secured site is the best place to start. Um, but then the second thing, the second reason is getting the client familiar with security best practices. 
getting yourself familiar with security best practices so that's a part of your your sales pitch so that it's, it becomes an ingrained part of what you watch out for, what you're concerned about, what you tell the client about at the beginning of the project. Um, all those things are um, going to help both you and the client be able to start thinking security from the beginning. Um, so sometimes it's hard to sell that to a client because um, it's a weird thing where if your site is not hacked, you think, why would I spend money on security services? My site isn't hacked. And I know a lot of times we end up getting new clients because they have a hacked site and they need someone to fix it and the original developer is nowhere to be found. Um, so at that point, yes, they know they need website security um, and they're probably gonna be more open to putting security measures in place after that happens. Um, but it, you don't want the client to get to the point where their site's hacked in order to convince them that it's important to put the security measures in place. We wanna avoid it from the beginning. Um, and then just in general, um, it's protecting your business. It's protecting your business um, and your client's business. Um, and and uh, you have a lot of goals as your website, you know, as being a website provider. Like you want to make a beautiful site. You want to make a site that's got all the coolest technology, web, web technology on it. Um, you want it to be able to do really cool things, manage the content. But um, if the security isn't addressed, none of that really is going to end up mattering because all the clients going to remember is they built me a site that got hacked. <clears throat> so um, the benefits of securing your client sites sort of covered that. It's sort of obvious. Um, it's in your best interest to um, secure the sites that you build. You don't want the client to come back to you with a hacked site and um, you suddenly don't look professional. Um, but especially when you're inheriting websites developed by someone else, and I learned this. The first time this happened a couple of years ago to me, I inherited a site from a client. It was a WooCommerce site. And we're talking about how she wanted to update her payment process, saying, okay. Um, and then it, it eventually comes out that um, the way her payment processing works is through a custom form that a developer built for her. And the reason it had to be custom was because she specifically asked him when this credit card payment is processed, can you email me the customer's credit card number? <laughs> so she was giving all these credit card numbers emailed into her. Um, and that was a huge red flag for me. Um, obviously because that's, that's a very obvious security issue right there, but just, you know, another thing that that means is her previous developer didn't care about security, or maybe he didn't know about it. So what else did he do, or she do, that um, could have been really badly implemented? Um, and the thing is, you don't always find out about these things. The client doesn't necessarily know that there's been bad security practices put into place um, when their site was built. Um, a lot of times you're gonna inherit a site that's super out of date, and maybe plugins haven't been updated in ages. Maybe the last developer was had a, a commercial theme that they um, edited the code directly, and they instructed the client never ever update your theme because it'll break. You know, so like those kind of things, um, they happen when you inherit a site. They happen when you're not the person that um, created the site. Hopefully, you're not doing those things. If you don't do those things, you are. <laughs> um, but also. It's in your best interest because um, hacked sites um, and calls from clients never come at a convenient time. It'll come like while you're, you know, um, away at a, uh, the weekend or on a Friday night at like nine o'clock at night, and um, a frantic customer that has that whose site is down or who's just got an email from their hosting company saying that their site has been taken down um, isn't something you can ignore. You can't just be like, all right, I'll get to it on Monday. Because that's like super unprofessional, and um, it's leaving leaving a, a vulnerability like that up is going to open them to even further attacks. So if they don't happen in the first place, you can avoid all of that, um, and then it just kind of generally is peace of mind. Just doing a review when you inherit a site, doing a review of the security. Um, is there any security in place? Um, are the plugins up updated? 
is core, has core been, um, core code been edited? That happens sometimes. Um, looking at all these kind of things, finding them when you first take on a project, because these days there's a lot of sites that are already existing. There's, you know, there's new companies coming out all the time that we're building sites from beginning to end from scratch. Um, but a lot of times we do get those old sites that have been inherited, and um, it's just really important to take a look at the security measures that are in place. Um, and if they're not in place, then you can be that awesome new um, developer that they've hired that is thinking about things that, make, that their previous developer didn't think of. So the more things that you're like, oh, wow, they don't have this in place, um, that really should be in place. Now suddenly that, that, that client is thinking, wow, this person really knows their stuff. My last developer didn't say anything about security. Um, so it give, gives you peace of mind and it just makes you uh, look good. Um, so the business benefits. <clears throat> In general, um, making the internet a safer place for everyone is sort of our responsibility as developers because clients don't know this. They, and they, you know, they, they shouldn't necessarily know it if um, they've never had a website or if nobody has ever told them. As the developers though, we know these things. We know how often it happens. We know how easily it happens. So uh, for us um, to be like the main first point, making sure that the sites that you put out are secure is the best way to kind of get the ball rolling to make sure that the client knows, to make sure that they're making good decisions um, moving forward. Um, so I kind of have a little analogy here. Um, I like analogies. We, I think a lot of times in web development we like to use analogies because sometimes um, explaining more technical things to clients is hard for them to grasp. So if you can sort of abstract that into an understandable thing, um, it can help them to understand. So who is responsible for security? Um, yes, it is your responsibility to know about it and to um, tell the client, but you the client or the web host, um, depending on which of these people you are, you would probably think it's the responsibility of the other two. Um, <laughs> But the truth is, it's, it's all three. But ultimately, it comes down to the client. So the, the analogy here is an apartment complex. The client lives in an apartment, in a big apartment complex. Um, you built the apartment complex, and you sold it, and that's cool. You, you built it with locks on the doors. You built it um, you know, so, maybe, so the windows can't easily be, you know. You built it in order to be somewhat secure. Um, so then the web hosts, they're kind of like the um, like the maintenance, the maintenance person in the apartment. They make sure that um, the locks work um, if you use them. Um, they make sure that maybe there's a locked lobby, that you, you, know, you have, um, that everything that the builder put in place works, right? And then there's the client whose responsibility is to lock their doors. Like if they have locks on the door and they're not using them and they get their house broken into, you're not gonna blame the person that built the house. And you're not going to blame the, um, the maintenance person because they, the locks are fully functioning, you just by using them. So kind of being able to like use that analogy with clients um, makes them you know, sort of understand, yes, the web host has responsibility. Their responsibility is to making their server secure. So they want to make sure that you, they're hosting their database and you know, the files in two separate places. They don't want to take on an infected site and suddenly have that site infect all the other websites on the hosting. So they're protecting themselves. Um, and then if they do see that your site is compromised, they pull it down um, to make sure that it can't infect any of their websites. Um, but, but the client ultimately is the one that will get in trouble <laughs> if their site gets hacked and, for example, credit card numbers is stolen or any of those things. So it's kind of everybody's responsibility. Um, but it can really set your business apart um, and increase your value by coming up with things that maybe other developers haven't really thought of or they don't want to deal with. Um, so I was a freelancer for about 10 years. Um, I eventually learned about a lot of different facets of, of building an entire website from project management, design, development, um, security, all those things. And, and you kind of realize pretty easily, the better you get at things, the less time you have to spend on each, each one of those if you want to do a really good job. 
And as a single freelancer, it's not always practical for you to try to do absolutely every single thing. So a lot of freelancers don't talk about security. They don't talk or think about SEO. Um, they don't talk about maintenance packages. So who in here offers um, a maintenance package to their clients? Okay. That's probably a, maybe a half to a third of everybody who, who builds websites. Um, that's actually pretty high. Um, but that's because we're, we're awesome developers that go to work camps, right? Um, but a lot of people don't even have those in place. Because maintenance is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, and you, sometimes when you're working on a project, you're like, oh my god, thank god it's done. Go, leave me alone. I don't want to see you ever again. This is a nightmare. And you don't really necessarily want to support it anymore because you want to be done with it. Um, but uh, adding the maintenance and the security maintenance in with it can actually give you um, additional revenue. So I know as a freelancer for me, it was always hard. Um, there's always a concern that once this project is done, what's my next project? And if you're only going bulk project to project um, and lining up the projects without any sort of recurring revenue in place, then yeah, it can get a little bit scary if you don't have clients lined up. Um, that's the whole, you know, freelancer feast or famine. You know, right after you get paid, you're super rich, and then at the end of the project, you don't have a new project coming in, and you're sort of poor, and you gotta wait till the next one comes up. Um, adding in these security services and the, um, the maintenance services can give you this like residual income. And so maybe now, instead of just going big project to big project, you do a big project, but then you also have maybe five clients who uh, you're doing maintenance for, and maybe each of those clients brings in $150 a month. So right away, right there, that's like 750 bucks that wasn't coming in. And really, um, most maintenance that you do really isn't all that hard. It's um, making sure you're keeping things updated, make sure you're checking um, any kind of security reports. And a lot of that, if there's no issues, a lot of that can be done You know, 10, 10 minutes a month, maybe, for each client. Um, but you're sitting there, again, you're sitting there watching it, so you're catching things instead of fixing them after they get hacked. So the benefits of commuting, communicating the need for security. Um, why would you bring it up with the client in the first place? It's sort of obvious, um, but we want to sort of communicate three things. A lot of times when you try to start talking technical things with clients, they tune out or they start to feel overwhelmed, or they start to feel like they're not, um, they don't understand enough to make a decision about things. Um, so you kind of, so if you break it down into some security best practices, um, each section of it, just kind of break it down in, in an easy to understand chunk. You can sell those little chunks a little bit better. So one of the first questions is why do people hack websites? One of them is just because they want to deface the site. They want to take down your site in its place, be Hacksaw was here, cool, yeah, you did it, right? Um, <clears throat> and those were happening for a, a, you know, a long time in the 90s and the 2000s, but nowadays you don't see that so much. And the reason is because um, right now it's, it's mainly a lot of bots that are automating these attacks. Um, and so you don't have someone like this kid sitting in his parents' basement that's like trying to hack the planet, you know, that, that, that doesn't really happen anymore. Um, but the biggest reason is for financial gain. So they're trying to automate some kind of uh, an injection into your site, or maybe a redirect to another site where they're going to try to um, direct people to a fake, a fake version of your bank, you know, so you can log in, they get your information. Or um, they're going to try to weasel in into your, um, your server and tr try to look at community, um, whatever you have saved in your database. Maybe you have some client information, you, all those things. Um, so it's mainly for financial gain. And it's not often someone just literally sitting there trying different passwords. Like that flat out doesn't really ever happen. Um, <clears throat> so the word malware actually stands for malicious software. It's like software. It's not like people. It's um, automated malware that is um, being scanned, your website is being scanned for any sort of vulnerabilities. Um, and 
if they see this vulnerability, they automate something that was built just to, just to pop in through that vulnerability, um, <clears throat> which is the reason that pretty much the number one and best thing that you can do to secure your site is to keep it updated. Um, WordPress being completely open source, when we release patches, um, to security patches, we um, most of the time will immediately publish that and tell them, oh yeah, there is this vulnerability. So now that that vulnerability is known, um, spam or hackers, malware, um, uh, malware bots, they know exactly what that vulnerability is. A lot of time they can even put that vulnerability into Google and return with a list of websites that have it. So they immediately see everybody that um, has that vulnerability in. One thing that WordPress did in the past few years was um, automated updating. And this is very important and it's very good that they did this because when updating was not automated, people would leave their sites forever, never update, um, and they would miss all those security patches. So WordPress sort of has a reputation for um, being insecure. And it's not true, WordPress isn't insecure, um, but the people who own the websites aren't maintaining it properly um, for it to be secure. Yes, WordPress version 1.3 is insecure. Nobody's running it because everybody's upgraded. Um, so keeping, keeping things updated, number one thing. Um, but when are these attacks happening? The answer is literally all the time. It's not just happening to small businesses, it's not, or it's not just happening to enterprise level, um, it's anyone. If they can do a scan, uh, a search through, the web, through all the websites on Google and find this one vulnerability and find all the sites, that could be someone as big as CNN, it could be someone as small as Jones Photoshop, it, they literally don't care. They will attack every single site that comes up. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna just quickly show you this this Norse antivirus thing. If you go to um, this norseantivirus.com or something, this is a, a little bit of a, a live um, uh, data visual, visualization they have created, um, and it's just it's just a small example of site attacks that are happening <coughs> constantly. So these are all live, and this actually isn't all the sites that are all the attacks that are being attempted. If we were to try to show them all, my computer would crash. Like we would um, consume the bandwidth of this entire Wi-Fi because there's so many. So they sort of average it down. Um, and this isn't actually um, just people's hack sites. This is just a small portion of um, honeypots that Norton has set up to try to attract um, these automated these automated mal malware bots. <clears throat> And they created this just to get an idea of how many things are being attacked. There's no um, vulnerability here because they created a. It's sort of like um, that movie or that TV show Bait Car, where they, they put the, the car in place to get it stolen, and then as soon as someone takes off in it, they turn the car off. It's sort of like this. It's not real um, websites, but it's it's so it's it's uh, things that have vulnerabilities that do exist in other websites, and it's happening constantly. So. Um, not, not a question of when does it happen, because it's literally always happening. Um, <clears throat> so, five simple website security best practices. If you can go through these five and get the clients to understand all these things and to implement all these things, and if you can implement all these things, you're gonna mitigate most of the attacks that are gonna be happening on your website. And it sounds like that's a little bit oversimplified, but it is, um, it's true. Um, so the first one is backups. This isn't really, this isn't really a security measure, it's more of a recovery measure. Um, creating backups to your files and your databases to make sure that if something does happen, you can back up and you can restore a previous version of your backup. Um, while that backup is working, you can then take the hack site and you can trace back to find the vulnerability. Um, Stressing though that just restoring your backup is not going to fix your site because that backup probably still has um, a vulnerability in it too. So once you restore backup, you have to go and you have to figure out what was wrong, fix it, and then push those changes live. Um, but having the backup on hand all the time uh, is going to be the number one thing that will help you 
get a grasp on what's going on and be able to start fixing things really quickly. So updates. Technically, this is number one. This is the number one thing that you can do to make sure um, that the most basic reasons you would possibly get hacked are um, mitigated. So it's not just WordPress core. So like I said, WordPress core does do automated updates. Um, but a lot of those updates that Core does means that uh, the way plugins and themes work, they have to also update the way they process things. Um, so a lot of big issues come because maybe you do have WordPress up to date, but you don't have your plugins up to date. So that, that vulnerability could still be inside of one of the plugins. So it's important to update the plugins, the themes, um, if you have a commercial theme or, or any kind of a theme that's not custom made. Um, and uh, core. If your theme is custom made, hopefully the person who created it has good security knowledge also. Not going to go into custom development, but um, everything, keep everything updated. Strong passwords, unique passwords. So in general, the number one security um, fail across everywhere is, is the um, it's on the human end of things. It's not on the, the software. So it's people writing very insecure passwords, like the word password, like the password 1111. Um, um, all those, that, that's basically leaving your door unlocked. And if you're locking your door, if they do get past you know, the gate, if they do get past um, the locked lobby, you're, then you know, your door can also s try to stop them. Uh, there's the website, haveibeenpwned.com. <coughs> It looks up your it looks up your um, email and your associated passwords and it lets you know if that um, those passwords have been discovered anywhere. Um, so you can kind of take a look, uh, log in with your whatever user accounts you use and see if they know your password. If they do know your password, you should probably change it. Um, okay, so firewalls and CDNs. Now we're getting into um, services. It is not practical for you to go out and build a firewall or a CDN. So these are service things. So the firewall, um, it acts sort of as a big gate around your apartment complex. So a lot of things are being stopped before they even get to your apartment because they hit that firewall um, and they just bounce back. They can't get in at all. So there's so many things that can be stopped by just having a good firewall. Um, there's options, there's a free firewall that you can download in the plugins directory, I think it's WP Firewall, I don't remember exactly. Um, a lot of security um, software and plugins offer a firewall, so that's a really good number one thing. Um, CDNs, so CDN is a content delivery network. It means that it takes all of your files, instead of sitting on your own hosting, wherever your hosting is, um, it, it takes those files, it duplicates them onto a CDN, um, and so now those files are hosted and they're being accessed at some, someone else's server. Um, it can speed up your site too because the CDNs are typically, um, they have, you know, a hundred different servers around the world. So instead of pulling it from one place, it's pulling them from a lot of places. Um, but those two things go a really long way towards starting to protect your website. And then continuous monitoring. So this basically means um, if Google detects there's some sort of malware on your website, it's going to affect your SEO ranking. It's going to show a little notification that, hey, this site is suspicious. Do you want to continue? Um, and um, it, it, it basically exists as blacklisting you. Um, you don't want that to happen. Um, so you want to be able to have an automated website scanner if you can that is constantly looking at your files and checking to see if anything's changed. So um, if you're updating a plugin, obviously the files are going to change. If you're just updating your content on your website, it's probably just staying in the database. Um, but checking out um, the files, if the files are changing without your knowledge, um, and it's not because of an update, that means that someone got in and is, and is making changes. Maybe they've written a script that um, is sending out crazy amounts of emails to people. Um, maybe they've written something that is, um, you know, it's spying on what you do. There's so many different things. Um, but being able to monitor when, that, when those files, files change and being able to get that file out of there when it does change or um, 
or you know restore it to a better version um, can stop it before any sort any sort of attack um, happens as a result of that being in there. <clears throat> okay, so including security in the project scope. So this is sort of all leading to this part right here. Um, including in the scope right away. It's a thing. Who who includes security considerations when they create their um, RFP or you know? So okay, not that's like not many. That was like four people raised their hands. So um, it's an easy thing to, to to forget. It's an easy thing to um, not include in there. Um, but including it in in your project scope from the beginning and saying, hey, this is a priority. We we need to address these things, it's part of the project, it's part of the work that I do for you. I don't, I don't build a website unless it has these security measures in place because I'm smart. Um, that sets the stage for now, um, it's, you, you don't really compromise on that. The client's not gonna be like, nah, I don't want the security. It's, it's not a question, you say it. It's a part of the process and then you maybe build that in with your existing scope, um, or you, you know, set it out as like maybe it costs X amount of money to implement something. <clears throat> um, so including the scope just makes you look more professional. Um, it makes your client trust you more. One thing that um, when I was doing a lot of freelance, one one thing that I've had project managers and clients say to me is that they really appreciate how honest I am with them, and that makes them trust the things that I say and do. So a lot, of, a lot of times, I know as developers, we get this sort of um, imposter syndrome where we're like, okay, we can't let everybody know we don't have, know how to do something because people will immediately think we're a failure, we don't belong here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's really not true, especially um, in my experience when talking with clients. If there's something that I don't know how to do or I've never done it before, I tell them, um, I've never done this before, so I'm just going to let you know that I'm sort of estimating it's going to be this, but the further we get, we might find out it's actually this. Um, so like that amount of, of transparency makes them assume that you're telling the truth about all the other things also. Um, so having that trust with the client, they're going to trust you when you say you need a firewall. They're going to trust you when you say, no, your password can't be the word password. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps them informed from the beginning. I guarantee you they're not thinking about security, probably not thinking about security unless they were just hacked. Um, because if you think about that old um, cartoon from the, the, um, the oatmeal, where they're like, at the beginning of the website project, there's this beautiful project, and everyone's excited, and the design's beautiful, and, they, and everyone's like, it's going to soar like an eagle in the sky. It's going to be amazing and gorgeous. Um, and then as the, as the project breaks down, everyone's just like super depressed, and they just want it to get it over with. Um, in the beginning of the project, you're just thinking all really good things and cool things that you're going to do. You probably, like if you're doing a redesign and their existing site looks really crappy, you're just like, oh my god, the final website is going to look so much better, this is going to look so good in my portfolio, they're, they're using whatever manual system that they're using in order to do reservations or blah, blah, blah. Once I automated this with WordPress, it's going to save them so much time. So you're thinking about all the good things that you're going to do and all the positive um, ways that you're going to affect their business. You're not really thinking about the security because you're not thinking about bad things that can happen. Um, so if you include it as part of the beginning, um, and you you say to them, "This is an important factor in building this website," then it's already set the stage for them to be thinking about it. <clears throat> okay. So quickly, um, backups. One very important thing is to host backups on a different server. So personal experience story time again. Um, I had to <coughs> migrate a WooCommerce site. This was just a, a last year. And um, we were migrating from some host, some smaller host to, to SiteGround. And, um, and it wasn't a big site. You know, they had maybe 200 products. Um, and so I went to, to um, try to migrate the site and I was 
looking and it said the site was um, like 90 gigabytes. And I'm like, what? Why is your site so big? It was, oh, we have a lot of products. I'm like, okay, all right. Um, or, you know, a lot of times people are uploading like huge images. I was like, possible, okay, that's feasible. Um, so we moved them over. My bad for not taking a look into that more deeply. Um, we moved them over and we realized that we were at such a um, high level of posting that was kind of a cost a lot of money. And I'm like, okay, I should go in and look at this. What are we doing here? What do we got here? Um, and the files looked pretty normal at first. And I was like, there, nothing here is like really suspicious. But then there was the one folder. Um, I don't remember what they were using for backups. But it had its own separate folder. And I looked. And they had backups of their site in that site folder since like 2009. So, um, <laughs> and uh, hosting backups on a different server is important for that reason, right? Because it's like ridiculously, ridiculously huge. Um, but if somebody gets into your site and um, they're looking maybe through FTP or whatever and they're looking through your files, there is um, a lot of, like the database will be stored in there a lot of times. Um, and they literally have access to absolutely everything once they have one of your full site backups. So make sure that your backups are being hosted not on your website. Um, most web hosts will have um, if they have automated backups, they will usually have them on a separate server. Just make sure that you're not saving them into the same server. Um, so backups, uh, you can get them through your host. A lot of times, um, hosting companies will try to um, make their backups more efficient to save time and space, etc. So they won't actually do a fully restorable backup. They'll do a backup that is sort of like restores certain parts and then like they kind of get their little tentacles in the rest of the backup and it's it's like kind of useless if you want to migrate it someplace else. Um, a lot a good amount of hosts do this, not all of them. Um, but just make sure that your host that your backup is fully restorable. Also make sure that you actually have access to the backup. Um, some some hosts make backups, but it's only for their own access in case technical support needs to do something for you that you just paid the money for. Um, so even though they're doing all these backups, you might not even be able to use them at all in case your site goes down unless you give them money. So um, sometimes it's a slightly higher um, hosting level. Um, sometimes you have to go in and manually do it yourself. Just make sure that if there is backups happening, make sure you understand what kind of backups they are and make sure you have access to them because if they're not restorable and if you don't have access to them, it's basically like you don't have backups at all. Um, there's WordPress plugins that you can actually use to do these automated backups. WordPress, Backup Buddy, Updraft Plus, um, all of them have paid versions. I think they all have free versions. WordPress is automatic, uh, the, the company automatic. Um, <clears throat> And uh, they can all be automated so that it's automatically making backups. And they can also, um, you can customize where those backups are being saved. So not on your, um, not in your files. Uh, you're saving them someplace else, email, you know, wherever. Um, you can also automate with a backup script. This is advanced developer-y things. Um, or you can do manual backups. And manual backups kind of suck. You don't really want to have to do that. If you're going through an FTP program, downloading all your files, it takes forever. Um, you, ha you can go into your phpMyAdmin and, and um, get a zip of your um, database, save all that together. It's fine. But when you, have, um, when you have to do this once a month and maybe you have five clients, you don't be wasting time on that. You want something that's going to be automated. In a pinch, though, you can do a manual backup. <clears throat> So benefits including security as a service. Um, when you mentioned in the beginning and then when you mentioned again in the scope, um, it sort of sets you up to be able to demand a higher price for your services because you're going to be giving them more than they would otherwise get. If you, now that you're starting to include the security, it makes sense that now your services are more valuable. Um, so maintenance plans. Um, I recommend, if you want to do maintenance plans, have um, maybe three levels at the most. Maybe the, uh, 
So maybe um, the, the first level is I will literally just um, have something watching your site and telling me if, if um, a file changes, right? Or you can go all the way to you know, something that's much more in depth and be like, I will, I will um, make sure I'm watching your site. If anything happens, I will pull it out. Um, I will manage the firewall. Like, you know, you can do whatever you think you have time for, whatever you think you want to do. Um, you can offer it at different services and then list them on your website. You can even do like a monthly subscription. Um, one thing that's awesome is recurring billing. Like, um, having recurring billing coming in as a part of your income is super awesome. Um, you know every month on X day of the month, you just get a pile of cash, right? And um, that you wouldn't normally be having that if you didn't have um, the maintenance packages, you didn't have the security packages. Um, so you can even be uh, doing that, setting up the recurring billing if they're paying you on your website, easy digital downloads, um, like a membership pro can all do that, PayPal Payments Pro can automate the billing. Um, so you're not just chasing down clients and creating a new invoice, sending a new invoice, waiting them to get back to you. Um, so if you can automate it, why not? Um, or you can just have it as an add-on service. So a one-time cleanup of a hacked site, initial setup, just getting them set up with that firewall, getting them set up with the file monitoring, um, or just an evaluation and review, which is what I should have done with the client that was emailing you know, credit card information. Um, tell them I can take a look at it and I'll review it, and if I see things, we can discuss, and then I can quote the fixes out, um, or just sort of in the, con uh, the consultation. Okay, so the benefits of automating those things, obvious, kind of like what I said with automating your backups. Um, being able to automate these things means that you're not constantly just going in, logging into every single website. Are there updates? Yes, update, update, update. <laughs> And if you have to do that with five, ten um, websites a week, that's going to spend a lot, take a lot of time. So there are services out there: uh, Manage WP, Infinite WP. Um, my company, SiteLock, also has um, a thing where you have a, a dashboard that you can take a look at all of your sites at a glance. Um, and then all of these, um, I can't really see that one, but. <clears throat> It, it lists out all the websites that you might have, and it, it can tell you this one's affected. Um, it can tell you which sites have plugins that need to be updated. Um, so having all your sites managed and accessed at one place, you can see where the problems are. You can do um, those updates. I recommend doing updates on staging, not online, for obvious reasons. Things break. Um, but use the schedule. Um, so once you start doing this, Having a schedule um, to remind you, like, oh, I, this day I have to do these maintenance tasks, makes it so that you're not um, sitting there at the end of the month um, spending way more time than you thought you were going to be, or, or worse, that you completely forgot to do it. Because um, having a client paying you for things that you're not doing is bad. <laughs> um, and then uh, password management. This is a really cool thing that you can just tell the client about and start using yourself. Um, things like LastPass and 1Password are um, their uh, repositories that save your all your passwords encrypted. Um, I use LastPass. Um, it, it has a browser extension. When you go to a website, um, it can be like, hey, I see you're on this website. Let's autofill the login and the password for you. And doing that means that you don't have to try to memorize passwords. So you can have those ridiculous XQ, exclamation point, uppercase R, lowercase Z. Um, passwords because you don't have to memorize them. And getting a client set up with something like this means that they're they're creating passwords that they don't have to memorize either. Um, so even just getting set up with this is a, a super big help. Um, so just a summary, um, we talked about securing your site, your client site, um, included in the scope, best practices, maintenance and reporting. Um, Something you mentioned about being honest with your clients and yeah. telling them. I, I was wondering if you could talk to my wife about that because she yells at me. I mean, I'm serious. She, she's like, okay, we have a client who's also a friend of hers, and 
she keeps telling me, she goes, you know, when you tell her that you don't know this, she thinks that you mean you don't know it at all. She doesn't know that you don't know like the latest version of whatever. So that's, I wanted you to, I wanted to kind of. Um, yes. So that's, um, that's a matter of saying that you don't know something in the right way. So think about like being in a job interview and they're like, what are your worst attributes? What is the worst thing about yourself? You're like, oh, I'm late to everything. I never finish any jobs. <laughs> so I start, you know, like, I don't get along with anyone. Like, I pretty much just suck. Like, you don't say that. <laughs> Even if it's partially true, maybe. Um, you're going to say, I've never worked with it in this capacity. Um, I've never worked with it on this hosting. I've never worked with it with this third party service um, on this budget. Um, so make sure you say, I've never worked on this exactly, but, and then, then be, you say. Be more specific. Maybe. Yeah. Be specific. Say it in a way that is a positive. Um, just like in the job interviews, like, you know, um, I, you know, I'm late to, you know, I'm late sometimes, but then I'll stay an extra two hours every night. Be clearly you know? like, vague. Yeah. yeah, be clearly vague. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there any other questions? Um, what was the what was the iPhone password domain again thing that you could check? Oh, you get to write that down. This one? No, the iPhone phone. Yeah. Sorry. It's not iPhone phone. Oh, oh boy, where was that? Yeah, yeah um, way back. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, there. Have I been com? Yeah. You can just Google that. <laughs> but it is have I been phone. It's P W N E D. Dot com slash passwords. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the recurring um, revenue uh, auto billing mm -hmm. slide. I didn't catch that. Uh, okay, so the, the recurring revenue slide? Yeah, the auto billing. Oh. Yeah, these are just three examples of of how you can do that. There's a lot more out there. Um, EDD and Ultimate Membership Pro are WordPress plugins that Ultimate Membership Pro is a membership plugin. You don't necessarily have to have a membership site in order to use it. Um, but it sort of it sort of makes sense that um, each one of your clients that's using that would be a member of that service. Um, and then e Easy Digital Downloads is um, Painter processing and sales for digital files. So, but they do automated billing too. Right? There's, there's an add-on for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I wanted to ask about reach. So, it's going to happen. Our sites might get hacked, or some of our data might get out there on the web. Uh, and in, in Europe, they have a new law that requires people to like ethically disclose when mm -hmm. they get reached. And in the U.S., we don't have that law yet. That might happen. But I wanted to know how you talk to a client or talk to a website owner about this conversation. How do you tell your users that they may have been hacked or something may have happened? Or how do you tell your client that may have happened? And if you have any thoughts around that discussion. So fortunately, I've never had to t tell a client that they now have to tell all of their customers that they have lost all of their, that their con content or their information has been breached. I don't have the answer on how to how to say that to people, um, but I have. It has happened where um, a site that I've built has been hacked, um, and you know if you have these these processes in place, then that's sort of easy. It's like oh they got through on X X Y because um, this update wasn't updated. If it's literally your fault, then it's your fault. Um, maybe maybe the um, issue happened and you weren't due to check the updates for another two weeks. Um, a way to sort of mitigate that is to try to be aware of updates that all your plugins have coming in. Um, you can get on mailing lists once you have these different plugins. They'll usually email you when a new version comes out or um, if a big uh, security vulnerability has happened in core, you can assume that your plugins are going to have to be updated after that. Um, if, if it happened as a result of them saying no to the security thing, that's pretty easy. <laughs> like, well, I told you, um, that'll be $500 and I can fix it. Well, I just want to call out because it's actually kind of a big deal because under this new law, GDPR, 
you as a website agency could be considered a data processor uh, beyond just the control rights. So you could carry some legal responsibilities potentially if you're dealing with your data. Yes, so the GDPR is um, a big thing that's coming down. And the funny thing is, it's not just if you're living in Europe. Um, it's if anybody that comes to one of your client sites lives in Europe. They're protected. Everyone's protected. Um, I don't have the answer to that. Um, it's, it's a big discussion right now on what everybody's going to do. At no, I don't think anybody has a great answer for it. Um, it's easier, like you're in Europe, automatically you have to do these things. It's harder to, um, to be doing it in other countries where we don't have that law. We don't have to do it. Um, I don't have an answer for that. And I think that in um, the coming months and years, it'll probably be worked out a lot better. Maybe we will adopt our own version of it. Maybe, I don't know. Shameless plug, we are doing uh, a panel at WordCamp Orange County about GDPR, and I can tell you security is going to be a major part of what we're talking about. Awesome. Well, I will be there. So he said that um, at WordCamp Orange County, they're doing a big panel on the GDPR, and um, security is a big part. So um, if you can make it up to that, that would be cool. Um, Tickets are still on sale. Tickets are still on sale. Jamie, that's all the time we have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.